talk about scams. Scams. What happened with Robot was very simple. Every record we've made comes from number one in the dance charts. The trendier DJs were saying, not on the stock I mean, and we started to see that DJs simply were not returning the stock eight from Waterman Records to the record made dance charts. At the time, the rare groove thing was just starting to be so trendy. It was like everybody was looking for rare grooves. And I said, fine. I'll show you how fickle and how stupid all this is. We came in and that record physically took us two hours. We played a groove, we got all the kitchen knives, forks and spoons out of the dishwasher. We took it in there, we got all the studio staff, all the lads in the building. We all re went down the microphone, we shook the cutter, we clapped our hands, made it sound like, we're going to be a roll black, and put it out on a white label. And the number on it was our lawyers in America. And I hadn't told my lawyer in America what he did. He's getting all these phone calls from all these hip and trendy British record companies saying, what is this roadblock? You know, we want to buy it. You know, we got offered 50,000. And my one record company. I, for one, fell hook, line and finger for it and bought a copy of what I considered to be an import record. It turned out to be from uh, Sunny Borough. And um, that has continued. Yeah, I mean, certainly a lot of labels have uh, pushed their American-ness, in fact, when then nothing, you know. But labels run out of offices in Soho, like Azuli or Cleveland City out of the north of England. The presentation of a record is, is very important. And where it comes from seems to give it a certain credibility. You can't get around that fact. And for some, some people, it's easier to sell, let's say, uh, a record from America to someone like Scarrett than it is a British record. It's just the way it is. So we just decided to shrink after the record put an American address on it and an American phone number and just stick it out there. And that way we didn't have to give any free copies away or anything. It would promote itself and it worked. It worked for about five or six releases. Scam. White labels traditionally were nothing more sinister than the, you know, the initial way you put out a record. You know, part of the process of, of releasing a record is you get a sleeve together and you get a label together. And to get a sleeve and a label together, you have to employ quite often a designer. Um, that takes time, that costs money. First instances of a white label was literally, um, this is the promo copy, the promotional copy, and we haven't got time to, all, to get all that stuff together, so here it is, you know, blank. A way of scamming a DJ would be to, you know, invent a promo, as it were, so start to, you know, feed things through with no labels on and no information on. So a DJ would feel he's got something no one else has got. I think a lot of us who started new tricks in the 70s and 80s, deep keeps the major record companies, marketing tricks, which they have then gone on to abuse, unfortunately. In fact, I think all records should be put out without any artist name, because the main advantage that would have is there would never be another Paul McCartney hit. And wouldn't that be wonderful? Scam. The original scams, I suppose, were simple sampling scams where they would lift whole parts of records and use them. Everybody does that now, it's not exclusively Italian. But uh, there's one notable company in Italy which it insists on uh, getting any record which is hot on which there's a buzz and may not be generally available. And they will send someone in the studio and copy it. They will copy everything. They will copy the vocals, they will copy the whole track. Scam. Basically, News of Ten phoned me up. I, because I was a journalist, they wanted to get to a little piece on acid music. And the next day it was on the news, so we course we videotaped it and took samples of Alistair Burnett and this girl saying, uh, the acid hot, sweeping the country's nightclubs. And we made it into a record, which is really funny, started out with the chimes of Big Ben, doom, 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 like on News of Ten. Uh, and then just had these people say, the acid hot, this acid, and called Don't Believe the Hype. When the record was out, we managed to get it straight in the sun on the front page. You know, royal newscaster in acid fury. Alistair Burnett, his voice used on a record advocating drug use. Even now, children are necking large handfuls of acid and ecstasy, unable to control themselves because this record exists. There's a lot of scams, to be honest, going on. I think the kind of club scene has perpetuated a lot of kind of scamming. And, uh, you know, DJs on a flyer. Events that are never going to happen, you know. But that kind of stuff, which is like, you know, a bit snidey, really.
I realised that you know culture club and, and, you know, and myself are very important in a lot of ways. Um, I'm, I'm very aware of that. You know, I mean, I still get letters from people. And, you know, it really changed my life. And, you know, if it wasn't for you, you know, I would have committed suicide. I mean, I do actually get letters like that. Kids they're from Middle America, up north. You know, um, so you know, I'm aware of it. You know, in America, I'm a drag queen icon. I go anywhere with a track and they love me. And that makes me feel really good because I've always loved track and I've good. I love transvestites. I'm obsessed by them. If I was straight, I'd definitely go out with them. <laughs> you see, in a way, you know, when I was in Coach Club, sexually I sat on the fence. You know? I didn't really say I was gay, but come on. You know, that's really stupid to think I was straight. When I was making my second solo album, I got into Acid House. Right in the middle of making that album, I suddenly got into Acid House and it exploded. And I, I, I just completely didn't want to do the music I was doing anymore. I was like, I want to do this. I kind of went, you know. And I think that's been a problem in my career that I'm very influenced by what's happening. And I'm more interested in that than anything, you know, being part of that, being excited by that. But I kind of, I don't really know what I want to do from one day to the next. And that can be a good thing, but it's not good for a career. You know, people like Madonna, they've got a sound and they work it, you know, they bleed it dry. Well, I didn't want my own label. It wasn't like a, it wasn't like a sort of thought out thing. I mean, I'm not that kind of person. I never sort of sit down and think, right, I must open a shop. You know, I must do a label. It was just accidental, accidentally on purpose. Web companies seem to be happy to just kind of release that catalog of Genesis or whatever, and, you know, all the oldies. And, and just have cheap dance records. And what I'm trying to do is develop people, their personalities. My religious beliefs are very subtle. <laughs> um, I mean, I don't know if I, I no, I mean, I, it's difficult to say what my religious beliefs are. Um, I just believe in uh, peace, love, and harmony. You know, I, I, I mean, I, I mean, I like Krishna. I'm into Buddhism. I'm just into ne learning. You know, I'm into learning, I'm into culture. I mean, that's why I call my band Culture Class. Because we had a Jew, a black man, an Anglo-Saxon, and a gay Irishman. My autobiography is called Take It Like a Man. It's just a play on words. It's been interesting. I mean, there's been certain people that said, like, please don't say I'm gay, or don't say this about me, don't say that about me. And I've tried as much as I can to honour their wishes. I've been very brutal with myself. And I've said up what I was like and what I am like. I mean, I think I'm pretty open about what I'm like. I've always lived a pretty simple life. No, that's not true. When I was in culture club, you know, I mean, I was pretty excessive. There was a point, you know, when I got really ridiculous. I had, like, limousines waiting outside the hotel all night. <laughs> Fancy tip me to go somewhere. And, you know, I used to have, like, loads of people flying to America to see me and paying for that hotel and just being, you know, really wasteful. Drugs, drugs, drugs. <laughs> I look back at, you know, the sort of drugs period of my life as a kind of movie that I was in. I mean, certainly if I hadn't experienced that, I wouldn't be as wise as I am today. So it was very valuable in that respect. I'm not saying everybody should go out and get wasted and get a great education. But for me, that was my path. Right now, at my kind of age in my career, I should be joining the old school, you know, kind of George Michael, Phil Collins, Eric Clapton. But I've studiously avoided that, you know, I don't want to be part of any... I don't really want to be part of the music industry, I don't want to become like, you know, a frigid or something like that. It's a horrible thing. That's why I paint my clean out. <laughs> I don't feel like obliged to entertain people all the time. I do it for me. You know, people always say to me, do you look back at your costumes? I say, they weren't costumes. You know, not Gary Glitter. There are ways of looking cool without looking ridiculous. I'm working on it. <laughs> Notice, what can I say, a breath of fresh air for us ravers and DJs. You've definitely got the vinyl vandal seal of approval. I don't know why I watch it, I'm not going to watch it ever again. Cheers, hypnosis, you're like totally top. Could you do it on some more things about sex? Like how you do it and why they do it on sexy music? It's crap, top of the pot, this is kicking. It's lovely, 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 and I love it. I've never seen anything like it. Play it on and on and on. Mm -hmm.